I always talk about Pembroke Street because it is one of Plymouth's great success stories. It's an inspirational story, a story of a community coming together, fighting back, fighting hard, believing in their community and succeeding and improving the area, the benefit of generations to come. Going back to when I was very young, when I was sort of up to the age of five, I remember it being quite a happy place to, to live. We used to go outside and play on our bikes. We'd play rounders of as a real community feel. As I was a little bit older, it kind of got a lot worse, a, more of a difficult place to live, really. I moved into Pembroke Street, I think it was 1976, when it was, um, rock bottom. The 200 flats at Pembroke Street are typical of many that Plymouth City Council admit are becoming increasingly vulnerable to break-ins. A police crime prevention report has condemned plywood and cardboard front doors, poor quality locks and metal window frames, all tempting to a burglar. And residents have signed a petition calling for improvements because they say they're terrified. Plymouth Council's housing officer Peter Williams says there are no plans at the moment to improve security. When they first told me I had it, I really didn't want to go there. I mean, before it was done up, it was like Beirut, wasn't it? With the cars, like, being blown up, and it was really rough. The burglaries was rife. Sometimes the cars would get burnt out. The fire brigade would put the cars out. As soon as the fire brigade left, they'd come back and uh, finish off what they started, burn the car out. I remember my mum having to push a chest of drawers against the front door every night because she was afraid we were going to get broken into. And as a child, this is a really scary thought that, you know, someone might break into your house. My mum used to sleep with a hammer under the bed in case someone would break in because she was so afraid. We had iron windows and it was freezing cold. We had one fire in the front room and nothing for the rest of the house, it was absolutely freezing. And we had a gang of boys coming over here, burning out cars and what have you, and we were just fed up with living like that. So yeah, we, we all got together as a group 30 years ago, and uh, just built from there. There are so many names that, you know, you've mentioned amongst the community, but you can't tell the story of Pembroke Street without talking about Christine Watts. She, for me, went in where angels feared to tread. She would have conversations with council officials, speaking with the authority and the power of her community and the care and the passion of her community meant that whether it was um, royalty or whether it was MPs and government ministers or ordinary councillors, uh, she spoke truth to power, uh, still does. When I first came to live here in the 70s, the estate was like pretty run down, but it got steadily worse during the 80s. And by the mid 80s, it, it was pretty awful. It was a pretty tough place to live. The residence group started officially in the, in the January of 1987. We were there from day one. Yeah. You know, we did put up and said, this is it. It was people power that got yeah, yeah. what the EMB is today. The initial residence meetings were about a lot of very dissatisfied people getting very angry with the council. But once we kind of figured what we were going to do, then obviously then there was a group of key people who took that forward. There was a, a core group of us and we stuck by our guns and we were determined we weren't going to live like that anymore. There's a spirit of resistance, this heartbeat amongst the community that something had to be done because nobody else seemingly was going to do it for them. We had a big meeting down at the Mount Wise Primary School. It was Darry Streeter that actually said, look, he said, you do realise that 
there is money there from the government in the way of a regeneration. It was like small groups of us like meeting with the council and, and then in the later stages meeting with the uh, community architects and then we had our own, we raised the money for our own architect. We had a bit of backing from John Duffin, he came and helped Dever us. Dever Cooperative Development um, yeah, Agency. Yeah. They, they helped us to get on our feet. We had PCC on yeah. our side as well, you know, they, they, all, yeah. they fought with us. We made a model of the estate. That was a really useful like, consultation tool. And I started writing to people and, and then it began to sort of take a bit of shape. And then people began to realise that we were quite forced to be reckoned with. And some of the older residents thought that the idea was unlikely to work because they were saying, if the police can't manage it and the council can't manage it, how, how do you think you're going to? We put hundreds and hundreds of hours in, oh, didn't we? Meetings after meetings. We were working on drawings, um, architectural, Built design, like everything. Cars, we can't yeah, and then eventually they said, mail. "You've actually, yeah, you have actually got that money," mm. and it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. We couldn't it? believe it. We had a few drinks that night. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just a few. <laughs> After years of planning and preparation, sending off funding bids. They finally got given the award, I think it was £6 million, to refurbish and take over the running of the street. Four blocks were, were taken into the, the compound at the far end of the street and then sort of came up in a zigzag. We actually lived in three flats during the time of the, of the refurbishment. We went from a top floor flat to a decant property where we stayed for a couple of years while the flats were being refurbished. It was a bit of an upheaval, but we, obviously we knew we were coming back to something nice. It started in February 93 and it ended in August 95, so it was two and a half years. Yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth the wait. Oh, it, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, it was, it was like unbelievable how, how different it was. It was lovely. It was, well, it was like walking into a brand new flat, wasn't it? And I still love it there now. It was, it was just a different world, you know, windows that opened and closed properly, no drafts, warmth, modern kitchen units, nice new bathroom. It, yeah, it was amazing, really, really different. What was straight away noticeable with the completion of Pembroke Street development was although it wasn't a gated community, it was, it was entirely open, it was like an oasis in Devonport and the levels of crime, vandalism, graffiti and so on were just much lower on this estate. That kind of vindicated the whole notion that if you can create defensible space and, and have a, an area that looks well looked after and that residents are, are managing the place, people have a sense that somebody's paying attention. Like anything else, you, you move into somewhere into somewhere nice, the incentive's there and you continue to, continue to want to look after it. It was just like going from a sort of slum area to a luxury area really, because everything was so brand new and everyone was involved in the development of that with the community art and there's lots more opportunities. Getting the residents to design artwork with an artist in residence. Pioneering stuff back then, normal now, designing out crime and th these were essentials for the community and the, the architects uh, that were alongside responded magnificently to their request. I think it was a, a, a tremendous, tremendous bit of pioneering work that was done there. New to Plymouth, new to lots of the UK, but used as a model ever since.
My particular role was in developing the youth services and when I got involved they were running uh, one session a week at the Mount Wise School just along the road. And we have up to 50 kids there so it was a, a little bit chaotic, it was, good, it was good service but what we did is we got some funding from the children in need so that we could develop and have separate sessions, uh, wider age groups, so we, we started running three different sessions and also supplementary stuff and more off-site activities. I was involved in working in the local youth club. It was really, really popular. We'd have 60 or 70 children coming to the youth club each week, lots of trips out, and again, that whole community feel was really rebuilt. The youth services didn't just serve the kids who lived on Pembroke Street. It was always a, a, a service for Mount Wise kids, so it was a, Mount Wise is a lot bigger than just Pembroke Street. So there were a lot of kids who weren't enjoying the benefits of living on Pembroke Street, and uh, that's who we worked with as well. It wasn't long before the old Mount Street flats were demolished and that, that's now replaced with, with the new houses on Pembroke Lane. So the whole of that regeneration that, that started here is spread right up and is now all up around Granby and South Yard's all redeveloped. Then Devonport Regeneration came here because so much, so much work had already been done and that led into to a £50 million programme. It's simply true to say that if Pembroke Street hadn't happened, the way that Devonport has been regenerated and rebuilt wouldn't have happened either. It was fundamental to changing people's attitude to uh, community engagement and community development. We've also created lots of, of employment opportunities. I've written countless references, I've written dozens and dozens. I think last year uh, three or four people got into work after, after being with us which was nice. I'm Colton, Colton Banks, and I was a volunteer at Pembroke Street, and I was here for a year. When I came here, I had no confidence at all. I, I was shy, as everyone does at a new job, they get a bit shy, but it actually opened me up, and I was like, having a laugh, having a joke, and learning new stuff, which I love to do. So, if it weren't thanks to all them, I wouldn't be where I am now. It was great to see so many people so proud of where they live, somewhere that had been through such hardships and you had the residents willing to work hard to make it a better place to live. It, it really instilled something in me and I just wanted to live here then. I just really wanted to live here. Being a teacher myself and seeing other children's lives and how, you know, they have like quite a happy childhood. Looking back now, it was horrendous at the time and to think of how it's come from then to now is absolutely unbelievable. It is remarkable, and you mustn't ever forget how remarkable it is, but all everybody there wanted was to be regarded as the same as everybody else. A reputation um, that had to be shaken off and a new reputation gained. Um, again all down to this fantastic community spirit. The people that we did work with, all the authorities, the architects, um, the builders, it was great. It was absolutely great working with all them, you know, to help us achieve what we achieved at that time. I think, you know, it's probably given me a lot more patience than, than I would have had. It does give you that kind of momentum to keep going, and which is where we've arrived where we are now. I can't believe it's 30 years, this is so terrifying. Recently we were thinking about moving out because two of my daughters is gone and it's just me, my husband and my son. And I actually put a bid in for an house. But as soon as I did it, I regretted it. I went home and said to him, I've done it, but we're not moving, we're staying. I would yeah. never leave Devonport. No, I if I won the lottery, that. I wouldn't leave Devonport. No. There's a lot of good people, people in, yeah. in Devonport. Yes. What happened here really shone a beacon and the people can call themselves pioneers. I don't think that's too, too strong a term. Everything else that's happened around it, the village by the sea, the red road development and further afield, wouldn't have happened to the degree it did without a few people in Pembroke Street 30 years ago saying, we and our neighbours and our kids deserve better and we're going to do something about it. <laughs>